What is up, my friends? Welcome back to another video. And today we're going to talk about mockups, specifically how to make sure that your mockup is a realistic sounding mockup rather than having something that sounds um, amateurish and just, you know, not very convincing, right? Because a lot of amateur mockups tend to sound a little flat. They, they tend to have certain giveaways that let the listener, especially if they're a layperson or even, you know, even um, a professional musician, know that it's it's not really uh, performing with real instruments, rather it's, it's using virtual instruments. So we're gonna kind of get into three core components that you can look out for um, to really consider when you are working on a mockup to make it as realistic as possible. But before we do that, I wanna give you a free guide as an accompany for this video called 10 Steps to a Clear Orchestral Sound. So true to its name, these are really 10 fundamental techniques that I wanna recommend to you uh, to look over to really make sure that you understand what you're looking for when it comes to creating virtual arrangements with an orchestra. Um, with the technology today, it's really interesting with the amount of like choice we have for libraries, but it's not always easy knowing exactly what to look out for to make our results as realistic as possible. So I kind of covered some, some 10 fundamental things that you really need to know. Um, includes things like understanding the timbre of the orchestra, understanding like volume balancing, how to mix certain things, all that's included in there. So it's totally free if you wanna check it out. Just click the link in the box below and it will take you straight there. And again, it's my thank you to you for watching this video. So let's kind of talk about a couple of components you can use and to listen for uh, when you are working on your arrangement to make it as realistic as possible. The piece I'm gonna use as an example is an arrangement I actually did for cellist composer Tina Guo. And um, she, you know, if, if you don't know, I, I had the opportunity to arrange this when she made a post one day looking for a MIDI orchestrator and I sent in my piece Once Upon a Romance, which is on my channel. She enjoyed it and we kind of worked together on this. So she sent me some original material and I kind of developed the second half of this piece and then she enjoyed it. So she wanted to play some live, uh, play, some, play her cello live on top of that as well. So we're gonna mainly cover the second half today because the first half is more subtle and it's really only featuring Tina's playing. So the second half is where my part really comes in. I also have a little intro there as well, but I wanna start playing the second half and then I'll kind of uh, mute her part because I wanna show you what I did with the mock-up to make it sound uh, larger than life and also realistic as well. So have a listen here to the transition into the large section. All right, so that is the second half, kind of the more adventurous part of the theme. Essentially, let me let me just uh, take her part, and maybe I'll show you just uh, show you what her part sounds like. Actually, I'll just go from here. So you can hear she recorded it dry her in her studio, and I basically added some additional effects onto it afterwards. So you hear I kind of panned them left and right. I added some additional reverb on top, and then here's the solo theme. You can hear how expressive and beautifully she plays every single note. I just, that's that's her signature right there. It's so nice. So anyway, let's mute that now. Let's unsolo this. 
the first thing I want to talk about to consider for a more realistic mockup is taking advantage of a library's dynamic layers and making sure the programming is suitable for your purposes. And this you might think is kind of out of your control because that's up to the developer to develop a product that actually has dynamic layers in it and legato and that suits you, right? But it's up to you as well because you are the one purchasing the library, right? So you have, this is why it's so important to do your research. But when it comes down to it, knowing your tools really, really well and knowing what they come with and how they, how they sound, how they play, that is kind of down to your own personal research and doing your own kind of investigations. So, uh, you know, when I was doing this arrangement, I had already had uh, Cinematic Studio Strings. I had Berlin Strings, which are both wonderful libraries. I had um, Hollywood Winds, which I, I used here, as you can see in the blue tracks. And then I think I also had Cinematic um, Studio Brass, if I'm not mistaken. And then I also had, so tubular bells here actually should be in the percussion section. That's my mistake. But let me make that brown. There we go. Uh, but basically the, the overall um, arrangement is using libraries that I know pretty well. And especially for the more sustained articulations, have, have a listen to just like the strings here, for example. You hear on the higher notes, I'm kind of pushing up the mod wheel. I'm taking advantage of those higher dynamic layers. And then when a new phrase starts, I'm basically starting quieter, right? And as the phrase grows, I'm turning up the mod wheel. I'm moving up the modulation. So the expression and the volume just dial in together more and more and more. You know. And it's great that Cinematic Studio Strings features beautiful legato as well. So it really works together perfectly with Tina's live playing. It really just uh, is, is quite seamless together. So number one really is to use libraries that have multiple dynamic layers, especially if you want your music to be dynamic, you want to have the option to have uh, to, to trigger uh, softer playing, also medium playing and louder playing at the same, uh, you know, to have that as an option. If you only have one dynamic layer, let's say for BBC Discover, for example, it's a free library, but you only get one dynamic layer of every single sample, I'm pretty sure, then it's not gonna sound totally realistic, especially if you want to have uh, repeated notes or if you wanna connect different notes together. If you, want, if you have a legato that's not very smooth, then it's gonna be difficult to have it sound realistic, right? So having a library that can do the job really well and seamlessly is step number one, making sure you have libraries that are fit for the job. Number two, is totally in your control. And that is volume automation and balancing, volume balancing and volume automation. This is very, very, very crucial, especially for orchestral music, because it really is all about balancing. Like what instruments come out over the others, right? So now let's kind of listen to more of the whole arrangement. And let's just have a, let's have a listen. Here. So overall, I think you would agree that the, the overall balance between the lows, the mids, and the highs feels relatively consistent. There's not one frequency register which is absolutely like overpowering and overwhelming the others. And that is really important. So that can also come down to the, the, um, you know, the arrangement itself, the orchestration, like what instruments you put in, right, and all that. But I tend to like or orchestrations that are more full over the entire frequency spectrum, basically. So I like instruments that take the low end, the mid range and the high end and split them up accordingly, basically. And once you have those, when you're doing your, your pre-mix, when you're doing your static mix, I like to drag all my faders down to zero or to minus infinity and then drag them up one at a time, starting from the instrument that's the most important. So this, in this case, it was uh, Tina's main, main cello line. She was the lead. So I pulled that up first and then I dragged everything up one by one to match that volume uh, at an appropriate level. Not exactly the same as her volume, but you know, uh, the volume enough to support it. So that is really crucial, right? And then in the arrangement itself, I tried to make sure that the strings were kind of the bed of everything and they don't necessarily poke out because there's no instruments in the string section that really just takes over the overall arrangement because they have to make room for Tina's playing. So if we listen one more time, You hear the violins at the top, they're sitting comfortably. You hear the brass kind of in the lower register, they're filling up the warmth, right? And the percussion are kind of feeling like they're further back. They're just supporting what's happening, right? Now they 
all crescendo together. Now there's the melody with the four horns. Right? Now if we look at the, um, the automation, this is the second part of it. So automation also has to uh, play a part in your final arrangement as well, because you could do a bunch of live performances and use the mod wheel, but you, you are going to want to make final adjustments before you submit the mix, um, right? So you can see here, my strings are very, very quiet at the beginning. And then as soon as the loud section hits, I rise. And then after that, they kind of go back down. So that is... Yeah, so I wanted them to go down because I wanted to make room for the horn uh, melody here. So you can see minus 6.8 dB, that's kind of taking the 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 lead melody there. Whereas the two horn ensemble then dips down to make way for that melody to come up. And then the trumpet's melody you see here at the very end, let's see. Kind of doubling the French horns there. Now the volumes kind of dip down a little bit to finish. You see, I also have a Tina Guo legato track here as well. I used the, the Cine Samples library for this as well. But you can see that the, the importance of automation, right? So th there will be no point where the piece is 100% balanced all the time just by doing your static mix. You will have to go back in and do some volume adjustments manually to make sure that the instruments that are the lead instruments are coming up appropriately in those moments. And then ones that are not uh, you know, the, the lead element, maybe they're the harmonic stuff, you wanna pull them down appropriately as well. So that's pretty important. So yeah, that, that's the second thing is uh, adjusting volume uh, through the static mix and also doing volume automation as well. The third and final thing is microphone positions and uh, just reverb basically, like putting putting the instruments in a hall that seems consistent with each other. So it could definitely help if you're using libraries that have a consistent signature out of the box. Like in my case here, I'm using cinematic studio strings. I'm also using Berlin strings. I'm using Hollywood winds and I'm using um, Cinebrass and I have Cineperk here as well. So all of these libraries are recorded in scoring stages. Well, Hollywood Winds is in the church, but that also has some reverb tail as well. But if we look at the, the mix board here, uh, you see I have the strings routed to a bus and bus one is what? Bus one is this, the string bus. And you see I have a little uh, plug in here, I have a send and that is specifically uh, bus six, which is reverb. So I basically routed specific instruments to the reverb um, east-west spaces. Now I primarily did this for the strings because Cinematic Studio Strings is drier. So I wanted to route them here so you could hear that they're, uh... have a listen to this. And if we take away the reverb, much drier, put it back in. definitely fills it up a little bit more and you just hear that lushness in there from the from the hall from the reverb so getting the appropriate reverb and just having having everything within a specific space if it's a concert hall or a studio space or whatever it is having that all matched together is very important so if you have a super dry signal versus a super wet one you'll probably want to put your dry signal through a send to go into a reverb that kind of matches the tail of the wet signal you could also try to dry up the wet signal by using an alternative mic position, like a close position uh, microphone or something. Um, it's totally up to you, but if you have the sound signature you want in mind, make sure the instruments are consistent within one another. So that's kind of the third thing, because if you hear two instruments that are playing together, but they sound completely different in terms of the, the spacing, like where they're being placed in a certain hall or something, um, that's kind of a dead giveaway of a, of a mock-up essentially. Okay, so just a quick recap. Number one, I would say is the actual sample libraries themselves. Make sure they have multiple dynamic layers because most of the times we're writing dynamic music that has multiple volumes and different uh, manners of playing. So make sure you have libraries that have different dynamic layers plus a good legato, functional legato that actually connects the notes smoothly between one note and another if you're doing legato playing. 
and you take, take those dynamic layers into account and take advantage of them. Number two is volume balancing and automation. So making sure that when you are pretty much done your static mix and you're going through your arrangement, make sure the actual balances between the instruments are appropriate. Don't let the flutes come up over the trombones, for example. Like think about it logically, think of what the instruments sound like and how they function within the orchestra and then balance that appropriately. And then go in and not micromanage, but specifically detail oriented, um, go in and, and surgically do some automation here and there to you know, bring up certain instruments at certain moments or bring them down. And then third and finally, is to look for reverb and uh, mic positions. So make sure you are placing the instruments consistently in the same room. If some instruments are too dry, use a reverb plugin. Maybe you can dry up the super wet libraries using a closer mic position, but find a nice middle ground where they can all coexist within the same space. So if you can keep those three things in mind, I can guarantee you a better mock-up as a result. Ultimately, the best thing you can really do is to just listen to a lot of music, listen to um, other professional mock-ups, listen to uh, live recordings always, because then you not only do you get a sense of where those instruments are sitting and how they're performing together, but the sense of the space and where everything is just coexisting together and performing in a very musical way. So live musicians are always a treat to listen to. Use your ears, literally just use your ears and um, have fun with it as well. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Again, I get, uh, just remember to download the uh, the 10 Steps to a Clear Orchestral Sound Guide if you don't have it yet. It kind of walks through some some of these things we talked about today, but in more detail. And I'm laying them all out very logically so you can digest them within like 10 minutes. And then uh, you'll be well on your way understanding what you need to do to ensure that your next mock-up is sounding clear and crisp and realistic. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.